It's such a treat for me to be here today at the spring commencement ceremony at the Naval Postgraduate School. You know, when my friends and colleagues ask me what it's like to be the Deputy Secretary of Defense, I you generally respond, think about the tethered goat in Jurassic Park. <laughs> so anytime that I can escape the game preserve known as the Pentagon, I know it's going to be just a beautiful day. But today is even more beautiful and even exhilarating for me because of the many fond memories I have of my two years here in gorgeous Monterey, California as a student at the Naval Postgraduate School. For example, after taking my first preparatory physics test in 14 years, after leaving the University of Illinois and serving in the fleet, I remember thinking, holy moly, it really is true that alcohol kills brain cells. <laughs> I'm just saying. I remember how cool the space ops guys were. I remember studying orbital mechanics on that day in 1989 that the Loma Prieta earthquake hit, and my wife, Cassandra, was sprinting past me out the apartment yelling, stick with it, honey, don't get distracted. <laughs> I remember avoiding classes with engineer students because they would always ruin the curve. I remember scoring 8 out of 20 on a statistics exam. That was the fourth highest grade in the class and thinking, I am the man. <laughs> and I remember how many Navy officers dropped their golf handicaps. <laughs> Lastly, when I was selected to become an NPS, I distinctly remember being told that in addition to a diploma, I was likely to get one of three additional Ds. A dog, a dependent, or a divorce. Well, I graduated here 25 years ago come September, and my beautiful daughter Kendall is celebrating her 25th, 25th anniversary in August. Do the math. <laughs> Score, I was right in there. But among all the wonderful memories I have here at MPS, I'll tell you the one thing I simply don't remember, who the commencement speaker was. <laughs> Heck, I can't even remember what he said, what he, where he was from, I only just remember thinking, God, keep it brief. <laughs> so I therefore promise to keep this relatively short, but I have so much affection for this uh, institution, and I have so much respect for the graduates that I did, would like to take a couple minutes to thank a couple people and also to deliver a message. I'd first like to start by recognizing the senior leadership here at the Naval Postgraduate School, President Ron Rout and Provost Hinsler. I know the last few years have been challenging, but I can thank both of them for the long-term, maintaining the long-term health of this storied institution. There is absolutely nothing, nothing more important to the future of our security establishment and the security of our great nation than educating, developing, and preparing our future leaders. You two are both the right men for the job at the right time in the right place. And I'd like, again, I would like to recognize them for the outstanding job they're doing. <laughs> like Admiral Rout, I'd also like to express my appreciation to the world-class faculty and staff of the Naval Postgraduate School. When I was a student here, Rudy Panholzer, Dan Bolger, and Otto Heinz, who isn't here today, but I got to tell you, Otto Heinz was the best instructor that I had ever had. Full stop, period, end of story. Anybody who could get me through a physics, electromagnetic waves, and orbital mechanics had to be good. But I bet many of you would say the exact same thing of the instructors that are teaching here today. Their devotion to teaching and research and school scholarship is without peer in my judgment. Secretary Carter joins me and thanking each of you and everyone who is not here on the stage for your dedication to high standards, rigorous education, and in making this a world-class educational institution and research institution that truly serves to strengthen our force. I'd like to, again, ask you to join me in giving our appreciation to them. I'd like to thank and welcome all the loved ones and the families of the students here. I know how much I leaned on my wife, Cassandra, 
when I was here. I well remember her taking care of our young newborn daughter as I struggled to finish my thesis. In fact, it's impossible for me to forget because I'm still paying for it till today. I love you, sweetie. Look. So I know from personal experience how important your support and constant encouragement and your patience were with the success of all those graduating here. And again, I'd like to thank you. No need to stand up, but another round of applause for everyone who has helped. Then, of course, there are the reasons why we're here celebrating today, the graduating students. To all of you, bravo Zulu, well done. To our many international students, I hope you had a rewarding stay here at NPS. I know from my own experience, you enriched the school and the experience of all the students and all the faculty here. You bring an important diversity of views that Americans must have and value in today's global security environment. We won't always see eye to eye, on every challenge we face around the world. But I guarantee you, because I see this every day, someday, in some unforeseen crisis or unforeseen circumstance, the relationships and understandings that you forged here today will serve both of our countries well. To the American soldiers, yeah, let's do it. I gotta shake 238 hands, so I'm trying to be, you know. To the American soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and our DOD civilian employees who are graduating here today, I want to thank you for stepping forward and choosing to serve our country during this difficult period in our nation's history. You're part of a proud tradition of voluntary service that extends back to the Continental Army and Navy and Marine Corps. The Secretary and I and the entire nation are absolutely grateful every day for your willingness to serve. But from wherever you may hail, each and every one of you graduating here was selected to attend this institution because you were already successful in the careers that you had chosen. And your superiors wanted even more from you. Because of the time you've spent here, the technical research you've conducted, and the personal investment and intellectual capital that you have made, you will be even better leader and professionals. I can state that with certainty from personal experience. And it will help shape the futures of your respective countries, services, or organizations. Now in this regard, I'd like to turn my attention primarily to the American students in the audience because I have four points I'd like to make for those who serve our great nation. First, we're at a pivotal moment in our history. We're coming out of more, to, more than 14 years of hard fighting, including the longest war in our nation's history. We're also leaving behind a very unique unipolar moment. For more than two decades, the United States has been unchallenged generally as the single world great power. That is an unprecedented circumstance. And that moment is coming to an end as we witness a more multipolar world where U.S. global leadership will be increasingly challenged and perhaps no more so than in the military realm. All one has to do is casually observe the headlines of today. Russia has illegally, illegally annexed Crimea. It's backing, separate, it's backing separatist fighters in Ukraine. ISIL is seeking to dismantle the Middle Eastern order. We're negotiating over Iran's nuclear future. China continues its provocative activities in the East and South China Seas. North Korea continues its overtly threatening, threatening actions, and we're witnessing on a daily basis rampant global cyber attacks. Well, such challenging and uncertain times demand that America's best and brightest step forward to serve and to lead. Because to preserve the peace, we must continue to demonstrate our ability to project combat power around the world, no matter what threats we may face. We do so because that is what our friends and allies expect of us. They expect us to lead. As Winston Churchill said in an address in Harvard in 1943, the price of greatness is responsibility, and the people of the United States cannot escape world responsibility. So my message as you prepare yourselves to return to the fleet and the field is this. 
know full well that our military will increasingly be challenged in the air, on the sea, on the ground, in space, and in cyberspace. But do so also knowing that you're a part of one of the greatest military organizations the world has ever seen, a force that has spent the last 14 years fighting and operating across the globe and at a tempo that no other country can come close to matching. So to any adversary who is thinking about testing us, I simply say, be careful what you wish, wish for. As Dwight Eisenhower wrote after World War II, it is a grievous error to forget for one second the might and power of this great republic. The second point I'd want to make is directed to those of you who focused on engineering and applied sciences. I urge and need you to take what you have learned in your research labs and in the classrooms here back to your organizations with a specific aim of driving innovation and discovering new ways of doing business. That is one of the top priorities of Secretary Carter and myself and the entire senior leadership of the Department of Defense. During the unipolar moment I spoke of a minute ago, we enjoyed unrivaled technological superiority. Given the lead that we enjoyed, it was perhaps natural, us, natural for us to assume that this technological superiority over potential adversaries would continue far into the future. But that assumption has turned out to be misguided. And the technological margin of our military superiority is eroding and at a pace that is far too fast for comfort for the Secretary and me. And as a result, the margin of battlefield overmatch we have long enjoyed is becoming ever slimmer. Now we have to address this situation with all hands on deck. It's a time for us to come up with new ideas, new innovations, and truly game-changing technologies. Without doubt, we're just on the cusp of recognizing the enormous potential of advanced computing and big data, autonomous operating systems, miniaturization, robotics, unmanned systems, elect electric weapons, energetics, and additive manufacturing. And NPS has been at the very edge of leading the research in some of these areas. As Under Secretary of the Navy, knowing personally the great strength of this organization, I commissioned the Consortium for Robotics and Unmanned Systems and Research, or CRUISER, and I could not be happier with the result. Just two months ago, the Advanced Robotic Systems Engineering Laboratory broke the record for simultaneously flying autonomous aircraft, 20 at the time. And this is just one of the many examples I could give of this outstanding institution. So regardless of curriculum, I urge you to take what you have learned here and continue to challenge existing ways of doing things, explore the art of the possible, and push the boundaries of technologies to their limits. We need you to help us find creative ways to overcome some of the challenges that we are facing. Said another way, we need you to stimulate new thinking on how we maintain our technological dominance and help a smaller force maintain overmatch against any potential adversary. Third, whether you're studying engineering, applied science, operational informational sciences, or business and public policy, I know that all of students have one common denominator. You have attended a school that teaches you critical and analytical thinking. And I want you to apply those skills wherever you may go, whether it's to weapons development or to military operations or to business operations. We need to reinvigorate operational research that was so effectively used in World War II by the U.S. Navy's 10th Fleet when they battled a scourge of U-boats in the Atlantic. Staffed by only 50 hand-picked personnel, 10th Fleet coordinated every aspect of the anti-submarine effort, including intelligence, training, testing, new tactics, concepts, and new weapons development. It was hugely successful. We need to apply that same type of thinking to pursue better business practices, to seek more efficiencies in order for us to divert resources from tail to tooth. We have to revitalize our war gaming, and I know that the uh, NPS is doing that. We need to explore new operational and organizational constructs. We have to do more red teaming. We have to subject all of our business operations and war plans to exacting testing, evaluation, and critical scrutiny. In sum, 
We need a new generation of analytical thinkers that foster and inculcate to everyone around them a culture of innovation, experimentation, and adaptation. Which brings me to my fourth and final point. Regardless of where you are heading or what you will be doing, you will be entrusted with leading the finest young men and women our nation has to offer. I generally like to tell a story about these young men and women. It involves a Marine patrol in Afghanistan. The Marine patrol was out. They came up over a small rise, and down on the plain below them were four personnel, four uh, indigenous personnel, Afghanis, who were, had a donkey cart and were doing something suspicious on the ward, uh, roadside. It appeared as though they were digging in improvised explosive devices. Young Lance Corporals and PFCs look to the sergeant. They're all alone on the battlefield. There's no one to call. What do we do, sergeant? Should we light them up? He said, absolutely not. The rules of engagement don't allow that. We'll go down and see what they're doing. As they came down, the four uh, Afghans fled the area, leaving the donkey cart there. But when they arrived at the donkey cart, sure enough, inside were explosive devices, and they were indeed trying to in place an improvised explosive device. The Afghans were no longer in sight. The PFCs and Lance Corporals and Corporals looked to the sergeant. What do we do? Very simple. We'll unhook the donkey, which they did. And the donkey started to walk. And the patrol followed the donkey. And it went to a village. And it stopped in front of a hut. And the Marines went inside the hut. And there were four Afghans sitting in the hut. And they scrubbed their arms or their hands with, to find out if they had explosive residue. Sure enough, they did, and they took them into custody. They took them back to the battalion command post, and the battalion commander was just flabbergasted. Sergeant, how did you figure this out? He said, well, sir, it's very simple. I was born and raised on a farm, and I'm a sergeant in the Marine Corps. I've been following jackasses my whole life. <laughs> Now, I tell this story because it just demonstrates that the people you will be leading are well-trained. They're morally grounded. They're a little irreverent. They have great sense of humor. They're mission-oriented. And they are endlessly, endlessly innovative. All you have to do is foster an atmosphere and let them go. And I'm sure you will be astounded by what they can accomplish. So in closing, after telling a Marine story, allow this retired Marine speaking here at this Navy institution among members from all services and friends from many countries to demonstrate my service ecumenical bona fides by quoting from General MacArthur's speech to the West Point cadets. He told them, you are the lever that binds the entire fabric of the national system of defense from your ranks come the great captains who hold the nation's destiny in, its, in their hands the moment the war toxin sounds. I urge all of you to prepare yourself for that moment because the toxin might come sooner than anyone here might think. It was a great treat and honor to be here with you today. I envy every single one of you because you have a chance to make history. I will be honored to shake your hands and give you a coin. You might not remember my name, but my name is on the coin. <laughs> I have learned. And I wish you the very, very best of luck. May God bless our great nation and our citizens, our remarkable fighting men and women, and you and your loved ones. Thank you very much.